Hello, everyone. Let me try again. Hello, everybody. I'm glad that you're here. My name is Larry Kluger. I'm the lead developer evangelist at DocuSign. And today we have a special webinar, a momentum talk on embedded signing. So uh, we're not all uh, together in one room in a nice hotel in San Francisco or elsewhere, but instead we're all online and we have the opportunity to ask questions and I look forward to your questions. You have, in fact, two different techniques for asking questions today. The first is that you can use the Q&A button to type in a question and you're welcome to do that and I encourage you to do that at any time during the presentation so uh, as, as soon as the question occurs to you. And so you type in your question and then at near the end of the the uh, webinar will uh, discuss all the different questions that have been entered. The second way is that, again, during the Q&A period, you can raise your hand by pushing the button, and then uh, we plan to recognize people who have raised their hands. We will uh, unmute, we'll do the first part of unmuting you from the control room here, and then uh, you will do the confirmation to uh, unmute yourself uh, that we cannot make your microphone hot. You have to do that, of course. Uh, I wanna say that today I appreciate the help of Aya and Melissa in the control room and also Callie who is going to be helping out, uh, especially with the questions. So the four of us are here and we are ready to go. This is the safe harbor statement. And uh, in case you miss it, we're going to be sending it to you uh, as uh, part of the slides. We'll be sending you all of these slides in an email about a week from now. Uh, and uh, what I also want to say is we're going to send out a, a poll right now. If you could fill that out, uh, this brief poll, that would be very helpful. Everyone's in listen-only mode, uh, but as I said, you have the opportunity, you will have the opportunity to ask a question near the end. The webinar itself is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Plus, uh, we plan to post it on our YouTube channel so you'll be able to easily access it if you uh, wish. So uh, thank you for your time in filling out the poll. Let's get started here. So there's um, two kinds of signing with DocuSign. The first we call remote signing, and that's where the signing ceremony invitation is sent to the signer via an email. And in those cases, DocuSign does all of the authentication of the signer. At a minimum, obviously, the signer has to have the right, uh, has to have access to that email mailbox. But in addition, it's common for senders to ask DocuSign to further authenticate the signer. Then there's embedded signing, which is our focus today. With embedded signing, the signing is within your web app and your app has the first responsibility for authenticating the signer. Now, if you want, DocuSign can further authenticate the signer using most of the authentication techniques that are available for the remote signing. And we'll be talking about these further on. The uh, key step for turning on the behaviors of embedded signing within DocuSign uh, is to set the client user ID attribute. That's if you're using API embedded signing, and we're going to talk more about that. So our focus today is on embedded signing. Now, the, the benefits of embedded signing is that it enables you as the application developer to maintain the user's context. They're, they're using your website and then you want them to sign something. There's no need for them to leave your application to go find the request within their email. So this provides a faster, smoother user experience for your signers and embedded signing is in fact very, very common for our customer developers and partner developers, uh, that is independent software vendors uh, when, they integrate, when they integrate with DocuSign. Now there's two ways to do embedded signing. The first is to use the API. And, the, uh, and I'm gonna talk more about that later on. The API, your application can talk to the API as you see in the bottom half of the picture here, either directly, direct API access, or via one of our software developer kits, SDKs. And you can see that we have uh, quite a few of them. 
many of our developers like to just use the API directly, and that's fine with us. It's a REST API and not hard to use. Where and and about another the other half more or less uh, prefer to use an SDK to take care of some operations. What I'm going to talk about first though is the technique of using Power Forms. Now Power Forms provide an uh, an easy way to embed uh, signing within your application, but uh, you have fewer options, uh, at which we'll uh, talk about. So it's easier to use, but it has some limitations. If those limitations don't matter to your use case, then, then you should certainly uh, at least consider Power Forms to see if that's the better solution for you. So let's talk about a little bit about the legal issues. I know you didn't expect a legal talk. I got a couple slides that's sort of the basics, uh, things that you should uh, be thinking about as you discuss your application with your uh, business partners. So there's two different issues with signatures, forgery and repudiation. Now forgery is what we have often think of, that's where Jim is signing the document and pretending that he's Sam. And uh, that's not good, we wanna prevent that obviously. Repudiation is just as bad. Repudiation is, a, is something different. That's when Sam or Samantha signed as herself, but later on claimed that she didn't sign, that the signature in fact is a forgery. So your mission, and we're here to help you with that, is to authenticate the signer to guard against forgery and to provide what's often called non-repudiation. In other words, make it that someone who did sign cannot say, oh, I, it wasn't me. So the way we do both of those is we authenticate the signer. Now, the appropriate level of authentication is specific to each use case. You have to uh, discuss with your business people what actually is the signature's value? What's the threat level? How often are signatures disputed? And the dispute, again, could be either that someone says, oh, my signature was forged, or they could say, oh, oh and, it, and it really might have been, or how do you find out? Or the other issue would be they say uh, that they didn't sign it, even though they actually did sign. So DocuSign has many authentications, and what's important to note is that these are built in. You don't have to do anything fancy, you just have to flip the switch or make the request and we do it for you. So there's uh, email, which we talked about. SMS is where uh, during the signing process, or in fact, just before, before the uh, signer is allowed to get to the signing process, DocuSign will send an SMS message, which the uh, signer has to then type in. And then that makes it clear that the phone number uh, that uh, it was associated was the phone number that the signer uh, had access to. Shared secret is where you as the sender of the envelope tells DocuSign a secret that, that uh, the idea is that only the signer will know, such as in the United States, let's say the last four digits of their social security number, or in Europe, maybe the last characters of their uh, identification number from the government, or some other shared secret. And uh, again, the, the signer has to type that in and that then uh, shows that they knew the secret. KBA is knowledge-based authentication where the uh, signer will be asked a series of questions such as here's a list of addresses, which ones, which one uh, have you lived at previously? That kind of a thing. Now an interesting authentication option is identity verification. This is a relatively new feature it, uh, if you turn that on, then DocuSign will ask the signer to show their government ID, either a passport or driver's license. And this works for many European countries in the United States with more countries being added. And uh, the, uh, they show the identi uh, identity card or passport to their mobile camera. And then uh, we have machine learning, which checks to make sure that it really is a government ID and of which type, and that the name on the government ID is the uh, name of the signer. So that shows that the signer has possession of government ID matching the signer's name. And uh, DocuSign automatically and very smoothly handles the transition from uh, signing using, let's say, a regular uh, web browser on a computer 
to, uh, it switches over to your mobile phone. And then once you've authenticated yourself, you get switched back to the web browser on your, again, on your computer. Or of course, you can always do the complete signing process on a mobile. And uh, I can tell you that your signers really like signing on mobiles, uh, if that happens all the time. Uh, we, have, um, we have digital certificates, uh, e-notary, and, uh, and there's other options as well. Now, an important option for authenticating the signer is your own application. So for example, if you have a, um, a, a portal, a customer portal, or a vendor portal, or employee portal, anything like that, uh, and then uh, uh, before you get access, you have to sign into the portal, you have to authenticate yourself, at that point, your software, the portal software, knows the identity of the person. And then at that point, when you ask DocuSign to provide the signing ceremony, you, your application, because the person logged in, you know who they are. Uh, that's again, assuming, of course, that you had a good uh, enrollment process so that the signer, um, uh, so that the person who authenticates is who they say they are. So your application can provide additional authentication, and that's important to remember. So your overall goal is to be able to prove in court that the signer legally signed a document, and I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do that. Uh, but uh, what I will say is that on the one hand, most every signature agreement is used without dispute, but on the other hand, you want to be prepared for, where there is, for when there is a dispute, and uh, DocuSign is ready to help you at whatever level for whatever uh, value of the signature. Okay, so let's talk about power forms. We uh, sometimes within DocuSign, we uh, think of power forms as API integration for everyone. And the way it works is that you first create a template within DocuSign, and then you create, then there's a command within the template part of the DocuSign web tool where you say, create a power form for me. And then you, uh, as part of that, you get the URL for the power form. And then from that point forward, anyone who goes to that URL will have the opportunity to fill in your form or sign your document or whatever the template uh, provides. And to integrate it with your application, all you have to do is have your, your application simply redirects the user to that power form URL. So uh, this is very good. Now, now, in addition, I'll just comment that depending on your use case, you can also have that power form URL. You can simply send it to people via email if you wish to, if that's part of what you want to accomplish. You can also just post it as a link on a website that says, uh, uh, if you want us to do something for you, click here. And then the person fills out the form and signs their name. Now, you may be saying to yourself, self, where's the authentication there? And the answer is in that case, there really isn't a whole lot of authentication. So of course, it, it, all of this depends on the use case. So what are uh, some of these options that you can do when you add it to your application? The first is that uh, you can include query parameters within the URL to set the signer's name and email. You can also set the metadata, the envelope custom fields that will be maintained along with the envelope, but will not uh, be visible to the signer or signers. And you can also fill in envelope field values, uh, also known as tabs. Now you, that includes the ability, you can set fields that the signers cannot change. So the, the fields that are read only for the signer. And you can set things up so that the signer, once they sign, uh, their web browser will be redirected back to your application. Now, if you want, the template and the PowerForm itself can require some levels of signer authentication, uh, including uh, KBA and access code and some other of our authentication uh, features. Not all of them can be turned on, but many of them can be. Okay, here's a uh, pro tip from one of, uh, one of my colleagues. And the idea is that you often may wish to obscure the URL. And the reason to do that is that it helps prevent people from calling the URL on their own. 
Now there's different ways to do this. For instance, you can make a web form, a regular HTML web form, where the response to the web form is the redirect to the PowerForms URL. Also, you can augment that web form to include data fields. And if you want, for instance, your server can check and validate those field values, and then if correct, return a redirect to the power form, including the data fields values. Now, this is what we call uh, the uh, InfoSec professionals, information security professionals call this security through obscurity. And really the full phrase is security through obscurity is no security at all. So what I want to point out to you is that it is possible for a thief to determine the power forms URL and to submit an envelope on their own. But doing these sorts of techniques certainly uh, slows down the honest people who, uh, as my father would say, who might want to try and uh, do things they shouldn't. So what are the uh, benefits of PowerForms? Well, no DocuSign API programming. That's uh, a big deal for many people. No integration key is needed. No go live process is needed. And uh, you have many features available, including importantly, branding. So you can brand the uh, look and feel of the signing ceremony of the PowerForm so it uh, matches the rest of your application. Okay, what are some of the constraints? So uh, the first is that the PowerForm envelopes make use of a single template. And also the documents that are gonna be so uh, signed, document or documents, are fixed. So you can't give one kind of document to one signer and different documents to a different signer as you can easily do with um, uh, direct API uh, embedded signing. It can be uh, tricky to programmatically determine the envelope ID that was actually signed. And also, as I just discussed, you have to watch out for the issue of PowerForms uh, being started from outside of your application. So let's uh, see a demo of a little bit of how this, how this works. Okay, so here we have DocuSign and I'm logging in. And uh, what we're gonna do is look at the template a little bit. Okay, so I go to my templates and we can see I've got a number of templates here, but the first one is the portal agreement and it does have a power form that's active. And I am going to edit this template so we can see what's going on. Okay, so it's got one document here. It's got one, what's called a role, and the name of this role is signer. And it has some envelope custom fields. This is metadata, where the office has been preset to London, order ID to triple X, and team, it's the red team. If we then look at the um, template itself, we see it's a form. And uh, notice that first name, if we look at this one, <coughs> this one, excuse me, we can see that's read only. Now, uh, the full name field is a system field, so those are also read, read only. But the user, the signer, will get to pick their size of shirt, their type of shirt, their size of shirt, whether in, to include a hat or not. Um, it's got some uh, verbiage and then a signature and then send receipt is a checkbox that by default is checked. Okay, so then what we're gonna do now is um, go over to manage, go to power forms. And uh, one of the power forms options is copy URL. So what we see here is the actual URL and I've copied it. And what I'm gonna do now is an open an incognito window and I'm just gonna paste it in there. Okay, and we're gonna be coming back to that. Um, I skipped the step, I'm sorry about that. We can go back to templates. Uh, basically to create a power form, you simply go over here and say, create power form. Okay, now the power form itself, if we, uh, here's a summary of our fields. And then what we're going to do 
is figure out how to create that query parameter or set of query parameters. So first off, we need to use escape codes because we're creating uh, URLs with query parameters. In particular, percent two zero is used instead of a space. So here's the power form URL and it ends with uh, ampersand v equals two. So the first thing we want to do is say is set that the role that the uh, the role name is signer. And we want to set the username and email of the signer. So we're going to say uh, Larry percent two zero Kluger will be the username. So there's a space there and and here's the email. So this is what I'm adding on to my URL. And then we also want to set those envelope custom fields. So we're going to set the office to be New York instead of London. We're going to set the order ID to be two, three, four, five, double A, double G. Now notice also that this part here is the name of the custom field and order ID had a space in it. So it's going to be like that. And then we're going to set the team to be the gold team. So we add that as well. And then finally, we can set the field values. We'll say that the shirt is of type T, XL. Now X for the hat will turn on the checkbox. We'll check it and receipt percent two zero will uncheck it because remember the default is for it to be checked. So now we end up with this. So now all we have to do, whoops, is go back. Actually, I think I'm gonna have to go like this. There we go. And now what I wanna do is take all of this and copy that and put it into my um, incognito window. And so I'm going to go all the way to the end. If you can see V equals two, I'm just going to paste it in there and hit enter. So now what we have is the URL that your application could make use of and could send out. And obviously all the query parameter stuff could be dynamic. So what we're seeing now is what your signer will see. And what they see is, uh, uh, we want the the um, location, and then it was sent by me. It's sent by whomever set up the form. And now you can see, here we go. T-shirt size has been set, but we can change it if we want. And we can change shirt size. And hat has been checked. And first name is Larry, but that's read only. I can't change that. And down here, send receipt is not checked. And so then if I sign it, I've already signed before, so it uh, knows my signature, and I hit finish, and I'm all done. I can save a copy if I want. Okay, so that's the end of that. And if we go back here to, um, to uh, manage my power forms, right here, um, we can, I believe this will show the new, the new one. I didn't refresh that screen. So here's the new one. And this is the time right now in my time zone. So this is what we just created. And we can look at it and you can see these are the envelope custom fields, which were not available to the signer, but are available to us. Okay. That's what we call the end of the demo. If you have questions on it, of course, type away and you can ask uh, live as well. Okay. So that was good. It's always good when demos work. Here's the PowerForm references. Um, and uh, again, you'll be receiving this uh, deck as a PDF in your email that you should expect in about a week from today. Okay, now let's talk about embedded signing via the API. So there's a new term to introduce to you, which we call captive signers. And a captive signer is when you're doing embedded signing through the API and the signer is not the sender. So in these cases, the signer is what we call captive. And we call the signer captive because they belong to the sender. So what does this mean? Well, first off, exactly who are we talking about? We're talking about the combination of the client user ID, the email, the name, and the sender account ID. And captive signers, as I referred to, have an exclusive relationship with the sending account. So for example, if another DocuSign customer has sent documents to the same person, either as remote, remember that's the email, the regular sort of email way, or as an embedded captive signer, your captive signer's information is not related in any way. For example, that means that they'll have to uh, re-adopt their signature. 
they will have to again agree to the uh, to the default electronic signatures are okay disclaimer form and so forth. Okay, now cap. This also means that captive signers can access their DocuSign content only uh, their DocuSign content that was sent from the sending account only via the sending account's application. So you cannot log into DocuSign. Suppose you have your own DocuSign account that you pay for or you have a free DocuSign account. Either way, when you um, have an embedded signing ceremony with uh, some application and you then later go to your DocuSign account, you will not see your document, you will not see that transaction because a captive signer belongs to the sender. Now, by default, the captive signers, again, because they belong to the sender, do not receive any email notifications from DocuSign because we figure that's up to you. You are the sender, <clears throat> excuse me. You are the sender, you're the per it's your application. You decide how you want this to work. Now, if you want right here, suppress emails to embedded signers, you can, um, I, the default I believe is checked. I unchecked it here. You can uh, use this or this other one to, um, to, uh, to change the default behavior. And this is on a per account basis. You should also think about whether the signed document should be sent to the signer because uh, the default again is they won't receive them from DocuSign. So either you can, if you have an obligation to provide electronic or printed copy, and that's something you have to discuss with your business person, if you have that obligation, if you want, we can do it. That's what this is here or you can do it through your application uh, as you wish. Now, obviously we can only send completion emails if you gave us the email. So let's see how this uh, works out. The, uh, there's four steps. The first is you need an access token for the DocuSign user or for a system user, and I'll talk about that. And because you need an access token in order to work with the DocuSign API. Then you are going to create and send an envelope that has one or more captive recipients. And your envelope can have some that are captive and some that are not. That's all very flexible. When you're ready to generate the signing ceremony, which we call the recipient view, then you, uh, you do so and you redirect the user's browser to that signing ceremony, to the recipient view. And finally, you need to, well, you don't have to, but Typically, you will handle the post signing events, which is where you find out, your application finds out what actually happened. Now, there are cases, there are use cases where the sender is the signer. And in those cases, uh, for example, it might be an employee who is originating and completing a form or uh, involving an outside person. It could be an employee uh, or originating a sales order or some other form and is one of the resigners, but someone who's not an employee is uh, going to sign via the embedded signing ceremony. Now, in these cases, because the employee who I'm assuming has their own DocuSign account and can log into DocuSign and so forth, in these cases, the application is what we call a user application and you would uh, use OAuth authorization code grant or implicit grant. And then there are the captive signers, which is, uh, I would say, much more frequently the case. So, for example, a website visitor who uh, is going to sign one of your forms from either their desktop or mobile uh, phone. Or it could be that uh, you've provided a mobile native application and someone's going to sign. Or it could be a portal visitor who's registered, who has, um, uh, who already, you, you've authenticated, you've enrolled them, you've authenticated them, they log in and they're gonna sign uh, a document that's waiting for them. Or for instance, they could initiate that the document gets created, the envelope gets created and they then sign. Now, in these cases, the application is what we call a system integration because the primary, uh, the, the users of the application don't have their own DocuSign user account. 
So in this case, these cases, you would use a JWT grant authentication, and typically you would use what we call a system user. Now, a system user within DocuSign is the same as any other user. So at DocuSign, I have my own account at DocuSign, Larry.Kluger at DocuSign. But uh, a, a system user is when it's the, uh, the email and the uh, identity are referring to someone, something, uh, not a person. So for example, you could have the name could be sales department and the email could be sales at DocuSign.com, that kind of a thing. So that's a, a system user. Now, an important note is that uh, we have a, uh, the iOS SDK has the additional feature that it can implement offline signing in a native application. That's where the uh, person can use the mobile to sign a document even though they're not connected to the internet at that time. And we also have this coming out for Android. That's, uh, I'm talking now more about the main, the main uh, flow here, the main sets of cases. And the second step is to create the envelope. So the way we do this is uh, on the left, I'm showing JSON. And the only thing that's different here is that I'm setting the client user ID. Everything else is the same. And this is the extra attribute that you're adding in. And I'm gonna talk more about what is the client user ID and why you use it and so forth. Uh, also, this all works via our SDKs, and we have examples of all this. You can also do it with a template. So for instance, you give the template ID, and then when you set the role, you say that the role itself has the client user ID attribute. And again, you can do this with any of our SDKs. So let's talk now about the client user ID. A couple things happen when you set it. The first is that it notifies its presence notifies DocuSign that the recipient is a captive signer and can be used in embedded signing ceremony and the email behaviors uh, change depending on your account uh, settings. But in addition, very importantly, the client user ID should be used as metadata because it provides the evidence link between your application's user record and DocuSign. That's how you can later on look up how you authenticated that person or what was going on because it will be maintained with the uh, envelope and, uh, and so it's there. And so it should uniquely identify the person within your application. Now, if you don't have that sort of a capability, then uh, what you could do is use the person's email if you don't have anything better. Now, suppose you don't have the person's email, that's okay. Signers don't need an email address, just as when you walk into uh, someone's office and sign something, you don't have to provide an email address. If you don't have an email address for the signer, then I suggest you use their uh, full name at noemail.example.com. And example.com is reserved uh, uh, by uh, the internet authorities, and so you don't have to worry about email going anywhere if you send it like that. Okay, next you need to create the recipient view. That's the URL that, uh, in a, that, that turns into the signing ceremony. So the way you do that is there's an API call and uh, within the documentation, it's envelope views create recipient. And the key here is to use the same email, the same name and the same client user ID from the envelope itself. Otherwise it won't work. Now, in addition, you specify, you must specify two other attributes. The first is the return URL. So this URL, uh, which may or may not be HTTPS, that's up to you. This URL is what DocuSign will send to the signer's browser once the signer has completed signing. So the users, the signer's browser will be redirected to this to whatever URL you provide. And now you can provide, this can be slash something, slash something, slash something. It can include query parameters, whatever you want. Everything that's on this return URL, and it can be uh, quite long, will be sent to the signer's browser and, with a redirect, as a redirect. So they will be redirected to back to your application. 
And remember, you can do this dynamically, right? So this, these can have dynamic values, dynamic query parameter values, whatever you want. You also need to tell us which authentication method you used to authenticate the person. Now, you, depending on the use case, and for instance, you might be asking DocuSign to do some further authentication, you might tell us that the authentication method is none, and that's okay. Uh, again, you're uh, confirming all this with your uh, business person. Now, this authentication method will be included in the certificate of completion that DocuSign maintains, and uh, this is a, um, a specific list. These are the values. Uh, and you can use whichever value matches the authentication technique you used for that person. This is where you put in the email, the name of the person, by the way, the attribute is username, not name, and the client user ID. Now, in addition, there's optional authentication attributes that you can also give us, if you wish. You can give us what's called the assertion ID uh, attribute, the authentication instant, in other words, when were, they re, uh, when were they authenticated, the security domain. You can also tell the DocuSign signing ceremony, which remember is running on the, on the signer's browser. So you can, if you wish, the, 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 the web page running on the signer's browser can ping a URL that you give us that tells, that tells your URL that the person is still signing. They're still in that process of signing. And this can be very useful with some web frameworks to uh, maintain the fact that the user is um, still using your application, uh, even though it's indirectly being used uh, via the signing ceremony. Now, what you get back from that last API call is very simply a URL. And the URL attribute contains a very long URL. And uh, it's about 1800 characters long. <clears throat> it does meet all the standards, works in all the browsers, but remember that your code needs to support it. And that's typically not an issue, but uh, sometimes it is. And that's why I'm pointing it out here. You don't want any problems like the one on the right. Also, the URL that you receive back must be used immediately. It is time limited. Now, what I recommend uh, as a pro tip is that you redirect the user's browser. And this avoids a lot of problems, especially with mobile signers. So what I'm suggesting here, and we recommend do not use an iframe. And there's no need with modern web uh, apps or frameworks to use an iframe to maintain state. So maintaining state, keeping track of what's going on, you can do that in your session data. You can use cookies, you can use a web storage API. You can set the query parameters and the return URL that I mentioned. So I very much re recommend that you not uh, use an iframe. One last benefit of not using an iframe is that way the URL will show that it is, uh, that the user is signing via DocuSign and that adds to the overall trust uh, situation. Now, some people in their applications want to actually email out that signing ceremony URL, but you cannot do that. They're time limited. They only last a maximum of five minutes. But as I say, you should only create it just immediately before you're gonna use it. So you can uh, enable a uh, URL that's longer lasting. And the way you do that, I'm describing that here. Uh, you basically store the data that you need in your application's database plus a random GUID. And uh, then what you would email out would be something like my app, and then you would give the GUID. The reason you're giving a GUID is so that a bad person can't just guess what it is and uh, get access to someone else's signing ceremony. And then when it's looked, you can, uh, when it's clicked rather, you can look it up, figure out all the information that you need call DocuSign to get the recipient URL and then redirect the signer's browser. Now you may want to do some additional authentication because the email you sent to, uh, to a given person, that person may then forward it to someone else. So you want to uh, keep that sort of thing in mind. Okay, so now we're at the end of handling the post event um, 
the uh, post event information. And what happens is when DocuSign redirects back to you, we will add on a query parameter. Now, if you gave us query parameters, such as uh, state equals one, two, three, or whatever, we're smart enough to simply add on the, the uh, event query parameter uh, to whatever query parameters you had provided. So we will provide, uh, we will add on this event query parameter. And the one you're typically looking for is signing complete. But, uh, but the, the, the customer has a lot of other options. And there's a old uh, user interface, a very key thing of don't preempt the user. You really, uh, if the users don't wanna sign, then they're not gonna sign. There's really nothing you can do if they don't wanna sign. So the better thing is to try and figure out what, the fact that they don't wanna sign and then deal with that uh, as appropriate. Now, suppose what they send you back, what we DocuSign send you back is signing complete because the person completed their signing of your documents. You should be careful that you wanna use this event information simply as a, or, or um, as only as a hint. You don't wanna use it for business decisions because the bad people could simply figure out this URL of your application and send back uh, event equals signing complete. And you would think at that point, your application would think, oh, okay, the DocuSign document is signed, I'm good to go and, and uh, send, uh, send the party supplies via UPS or something. So you don't want to use it for business decisions. For the business decision, you should make the request to DocuSign for the envelope status, or of course, you can use a webhook to receive uh, proactive notifications from us before you make a business decision. So let's see it in action. Okay, so what we have here, once my, once I find the right browser, no, oh, that's too bad. Um, okay, this is it. So what we have here is one of our sample uh, code, code examples. I'm running the PHP code example on my local machine. And this launcher um, lets you uh, log into DocuSign and then I'm now, uh, I was already logged in, that's why I wasn't asked for another name and password again. And then it has many different examples. And the, because you receive the source code for this, of course, you have access to all the source code and all the different uh, examples. We're gonna use the very first one, embedded signing ceremony. So at this point, we are using the application and the access token came because I logged in. But as I explained, uh, usually the access token would come via JWT authentication because normally the user of your application or very commonly the user of your application is not the signer. So here we have a default signer email and uh, the name. <clears throat> and we are now going to go through the embedded signing process. So we're first creating the envelope and then we're creating the, uh, the recipient view, the signing ceremony URL. If you were watching carefully, you saw what it was. And now DocuSign has further switched URLs to, to this one. And here we are with the embedded signing ceremony. And we can look at this and say, yes, I'm gonna sign, <clears throat> excuse me. I've already signed before as this captive signer that's why I was not asked to uh, adopt my signature. And then when I finish, I go back to the application and I gave all of this, including localhost, remember uh, I'm just running this on my own host, the, what you see in blue uh, plus HTTPS, which is not being shown by the browser, what you see here in blue is what I sent as a return URL. And uh, that was of course sent back to my browser and along with the event of signing complete. So there you go. 
So the signing is complete. And at this point, I could look up the envelope. Because remember, the first step, or, or not the first step, one of the steps was creating the envelope. And when you create the envelope, you get back the envelope ID. So my application has the envelope ID, and my application could then look up more uh, if the form, if the envelope had a form and, and so forth. Okay. So let's talk about testing. Key is to do a lot of testing and you'll want to um, try out all these non-signing events of, um, uh, to make sure your application can handle them. Test with a mobile, tablet, and desktop. So we're at the uh, questions phase now. And um, the, uh, so this is your opportunity to ask questions. And we can also, you can raise your hand if you would like to ask uh, any questions on um, live. So uh, Callie, do we have any questions? How's it going? We do. Um, let's start with one that came in over the chat. So this one, today, this is your question. And today, wanted to know um, if it's possible to bring your own certificate for e-signatures. Uh, okay, so, so let's make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So to me, when someone says certificate, that means an X409 uh, certificate. And, and, uh, and, and as a signer, a digital certificates are, uh, the way we normally see the certificates is for, um, is for the, uh, is websites and so forth, but certificates can also be issued to individuals so that they can sign documents. And at that point, the document is signed with what's called either uh, an advanced signature or a qualified signature, depending on the source of the certificate. The, the, uh, let me jump to the answer. The answer is yes. The DocuSign account uh, needs to have the appropriate features to support digital signatures or advanced or qualified signatures. And we support what's called a signer held uh, certificates. And so all that does work. In addition, uh, what we find more often, especially this is in Europe where there are many different types of agreements that must be signed using either advanced electronic signatures or qualified electronic signatures. What we find is that often people prefer to have DocuSign issue those certificates to the signer so they can sign with one of those certificates and, and they don't have to have their own. And we uh, support that as well. And that includes the most um, stringent type of certificate, the qualified electronic signature uh, situation where the certificate must be issued by, a, um, by, by either, by basically a trust uh, service provider who is chartered either directly or indirectly by the government. And uh, we can issue those on the fly. We have a company in uh, Switzerland or maybe it's Germany, I forget which, which uh, will interview the signer uh, on video chat uh, live as they are about ready to sign, verify their identity, and then issue them a qualified electronic, uh, sorry, a qualified certificate, which can then be used to create a qualified electronic signature on a DocuSign, a DocuSign document. And that is all built into DocuSign and we're happy to uh, help you more with that. Good question. What's the next one? It is a good question. And this one's also kind of interesting. Um, Brian wants to know if we have any plans to allow, for example, sending a set of form parameters to DocuSign for a power form, getting an identifier back, and then redirecting the user to a URL using that identifier. And he's wondering if maybe that behavior is too API-like for the power forms use case. Yeah, it's a good idea, but unfortunately, uh, the power forms doesn't support that right now. And so for those sorts of things, you would need to go to uh, the regular API embedded signing. Now, what I'll mention with API embedded signing is that it's the, the unique thing about power forms is that when you go to the URL, DocuSign 
poof creates an envelope for the signer so they can sign. And my point is that you can do that within your own application. You simply have your application uh, fetch an access token from DocuSign, which you can do all by itself using JWT. And then uh, with that access token, your, your application can create on the fly a customized uh, envelope and then uh, enable the signer to sign it. Okay, uh, one more sort of interesting one. So this one's also about embedded signing and Daniel wants to know if we can enforce DocuSign making the user authenticate again. And what he means is um, he's saying cookies and so on should be ignored. Um, for instance, in the case where someone didn't lock their PC and then another person can access the app um, because the first person stored their password. So is it possible for DocuSign to say you've got to authenticate again? Yes, when, well, okay. So, uh, so something we want to remember is that signers, so there are use cases where you want the signer to have a DocuSign account, or maybe we're just talking about an application that enables people to, um, that enables people within your company who all have DocuSign accounts to log into DocuSign and, uh, and, and use your application, which does things with the API. In either case, the, the, um, when your application enables, when your application uses authorization code grant uh, to enable the user to authenticate themselves to DocuSign, you can tell authorization code grant uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the parameters that you send to us, you can tell us that the user must re-authenticate. And uh, we, of course, will then do that. And so if there were, if there was a already live uh, authentication session, it will not be used, it will be ignored. It will in fact be ended by whatever happens. If the person does authenticate themselves, then it's whoever that person is. And if they don't, then, then the old session is canceled and no one's authenticated anymore. Good. Um, I think that's all we have that's come in on the Q&A. So I want to give everybody one more chance. If you have any lingering questions, feel free to submit them now. Uh, and also, you are very welcome to address everybody. Just think of yourself as being in the nice conference room in the nice hotel. And uh, we'd be happy to uh, hear your question live. So, um, so while you think about any extra questions or that, or that option, let me tell you a little bit about some developer resources and other things that are going on. The first is that uh, the primary developer resource that we recommend for you uh, is Stack Overflow. We have a very large number of questions that have already been answered. And also we have uh, multiple people here who, who work hard to answer your Stack Overflow questions as, as soon as possible. Most are answered within a day. And uh, of course the benefit of Stack Overflow is you can build up your reputation and, and also the answers then help everybody. You can also uh, use our support center if you are a support customer. We have DocuSign University with many classes uh, and courses uh, and no charge. We have the DocuSign developer blog where we, the technical staff, very often blog about all sorts of interesting things and I urge you to check that out. We also have, I'm not seeing it here, we have our newsletter and you can subscribe to it at developers.docusign.com, which is our developer center. We have upcoming webinars where you can ask questions and get an overview of the DocuSign API. Uh, used for e-signature, and those are coming May 20th and also three different uh, sessions in June, and you can see the information there. You can sign up again through the Developer Center, that's developers.docusign.com. Lastly, we have an active YouTube channel, and you want to be sure to look for the Developer channel, that's DocuSign for Developers. We also have a generic DocuSign uh, YouTube channel. 
I've just released a seven minute video of how of programming power form. So that's very focused on that specific subject. And also this webinar will be posted on the YouTube channel itself. Also, I want to mention that we are going to be sponsoring and hosting a virtual hackathon with excellent prizes. And that's uh, coming in July will be the hackathon itself and details will be posted quite soon on the developer center. Okay, and before we close, Larry, we just got one more quick question about ID Verify, and Daniel wants to know what plans, um, specifically which API plan is he able to use ID Verify on? Okay, so the uh, ID Verify is a feature that is added to your account. So it can be used at the first level, it can be used with any of our API plans, and, can, and also um, many of our general uh, DocuSign plans include API support, starting with the Business Pro uh, uh, plan and up. But for any and all of these plans, if you wish to use the ID Verify, then you should talk to DocuSign to have that uh, specifically added to your account. And uh, we can, of course, we're happy to help you up, ha happy to help you with that. And uh, that uh, the similar process is true for uh, using digital signature support. Great. Uh, any last um, option for people to raise their hand? Nope. Okay. So I want to thank uh, Callie and Aya and Melissa who've been helping us out so much to bring all of this to you. I want to thank all of you, our attendees from all over the world, and we wish you the, the very best, and thank you very much for developing with DocuSign.